Welcome back. Enjoy that three-day weekend? No, there wasn't one. That's why. Pop quiz. I was just testing to see if you were paying attention or not. So. I could go for a three-day weekend right now. <clears throat> Agreed? Yes. Should we just call off class today? Yes. And do twice as fast on Wednesday? No. no. All eight. <laughs> sure, if we're going to dream, might as well dream big, right? <laughs> All apps too, right? I mean, that goes both ways. All right, so uh, we're in very good shape with nucleotide metabolism. And I hope one of the things that I uh, communicated to you in talking about it on Friday was the importance of balance. And as I said when I started the lecture about nucleotide metabolism, I mentioned the importance of maintaining that balance. If the nucleotides get out of whack, we make too much A, or we make too much G, or too much C, or too little U, or whatever, um, then we're much more likely to have mutation inside of cells. So it's very important that cells maintain this balance. And we're going to see even more balance today. Okay? So you saw balance last time about, uh, between purines and uh, pyrimidines. You saw balance within pyrimidines. And you saw balance within purines. Today, you're going to see balance um, of uh, deoxyribonucleotides as well. And there are interesting schemes by which cells do these things. Well, um, I'm going to start today uh, by talking about DNTP synthesis. You'll notice on the outline that I've got salvage up here. And I will save that uh, until I talk about some things at the end. So I'll salvage actually does become significant for uh, some components of human disease, as we shall see. But before I do that, I do want to talk about uh, deoxyribonucleotide uh, synthesis or DNTP synthesis. Um, it turns out that DNTP synthesis uh, is uh, derived, not surprisingly, from ribonucleotide synthesis. And there's an interesting hook with it. The interesting hook is that the deoxyribonucleotides that you see down here, and by the way, you can put a D on there. A lot of people don't. I happen to like putting a D on there. Uh, the reason they don't put a D on there was originally it was felt that, well, thymine or thymidine nucleotides don't appear in RNA, so there's no reason to put a D because it's automatically D. But in fact, some RNAs have ribothymidine. So I think we really should ignore that old thing and put it as a DTTP. I'll take either, but in any event. Well, as we look at the scheme, what we see is that the starting materials for making the deoxyribonucleotides are nucleoside diphosphates, ADP, GDP, CDP, UDP, okay? And those individual, uh, de uh, I'm sorry, those individual nucleoside diphosphates are converted into deoxynucleoside diphosphates. By the way, a nucleoside diphosphate, people say, why do you say nucleoside? Why don't you say nucleotide phosphate? Well, that would be redundant. A nucleotide has a phosphate in it, right? So a nucleoside phosphate equals a nucleotide. Nucleoside has no phosphate. Put a phosphate on a nucleoside, you've got a, you've got a nucleotide. So nucleoside diphosphate all right, is the starting material for this. And all of the nucleoside diphosphates are acted on by the same enzyme. The enzyme in this case is ribonucleotide reductase. Okay? Now I'm going to have a, a few things to say about that enzyme in just a bit. All right? But suffice it to say, one enzyme handles all of them. And this enzyme has a very interesting regulatory scheme involving allosterism. Two types of allosterism, as we shall see. And I'm going to give you a simplification for one of them. Okay? The other one's pretty straightforward as it is. Because of this enzyme, we can make deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates. Notice we're making diphosphates from diphosphates. We're not creating phosphates out of thin air. Okay? These deoxyribonucleoside diphosphates can be converted into deoxyribonucleoside triphosphates by our favorite enzyme, which acted on all the diphosphates, which was? I can't hear you. Anybody remember it from last lecture? NDPK, thank you. NDPK works on all of the diphosphates, as I mentioned last time. All right? So NDPK will take us here. Now, this 
figure is a little misleading in that there's not one step in going from here to here. I'm going to talk about this separately, but there's a couple of steps that's necessary to get to this point. And they're kind of interesting and they're kind of odd. Okay? So we'll keep this one, this last one in mind um, for um, upcoming discussion. Okay. Well, if we look at ribonucleotide reductase, it's one of the most studied enzymes of all of nucleotide metabolism. It has, it, it consists of a set of two dimers. There's the, what's called the large subunit, which is known as the R1 subunit. It's also called the large subunit. And there's a small subunit called the R2 subunit, and both of these are present in a dimer, as you can see here. The R1 subunit is the place where the reaction is catalyzed. So that conversion, and, and what this enzyme is doing, remember it's converting ribonucleoside diphosphate to deoxyribonucleoside diphosphate. What's happening is it's converting the ribose in that ribonucleotide into a, deoxyribonucle and into a deoxyribose in that nucleotide. That's how we get the D. All right? So we're having to basically convert an OH to an H. And that's what this enzyme is doing. The reaction is catalyzed in the large subunit, as I mentioned. The small, subu the small subunit, with my microphone going off. Doo -doo -doo. Hello. OK. The small subunit. Um, has some very interesting features about it, however. Okay? One is that it has within it something called, well, it, has, it has a side chain of tyrosine that ultimately is responsible for making this reaction possible. And I think my thing is giving out on battery. And there are no more. Hmm. I shall speak loud. All right, so the side chain, I'm just going to take this thing off and turn it off. The side chain of uh, this tyrosine in the small subunit gets made into a radical. There's actually a proton that gets pulled off of it by an unusual reaction, and we don't need to worry about the reaction. But this causes... A, uh, basically an unstable electronic configuration in the side chain of a tyrosine in the small subunit. What's interesting is that electronic instability is communicated all the way back to the large subunit at the active site. Now, if you want to have really good evidence or you're interested in electronic circuits that exist in biomolecules, this is a prime example of an electronic circuit because the instability is created here. It's communicated all the way through the subunit, all the way up through the other subunit into the active site. That's pretty cool. All right? And because of that, the active site catalyzes the reaction. I'm going to show you a mechanism. I'm not going to hold you responsible for a mechanism, but I'll show you that in just a little bit. OK. Now, yes, sir? Does this enzyme work on two riboses at a time or only one? The, two, the subunits, as far as I know, will act independently. So they can have two at the same time or one at a time. It really doesn't matter. OK? Now, another interesting feature. Yes, sir? Um, I think they're 9 volts. Yeah. So let's see. I'll make sure of that. Oh, actually, they're not. No, they're, they're double A's. You have a double A? Oh, look at this. Uh, 12? <laughs> but two would do. <laughs> What's that? Do you get an A for the I don't, Should I give him an A for the day? Whoa. <laughs> Just a second. I'll come get him. <laughs> they usually have a, an extra pack in there. They don't have an extra pack today. All right. So batteries. Thank you, sir. I will see that you get replacements. Now, we'll see, make sure this works. We'll see. Ta -da -da. Ta -da -da. Hello. <laughs> All right. People don't like me shouting so much. That's probably why he said, take the batteries. I don't want him spitting all over the first three rows here. <laughs> I had that happen. You never told you the story before about going to Ashland? 
And I get to Ashland, and uh, I uh, didn't have any tickets. So I go and I buy tickets. It's a true story. I go and I buy tickets at Ashland. And there's this guy there, and he says, I've got front row seats for you on the outdoor theater. And I said, that's awesome. How much do you want? I figure he's going to scout me, right? I'll let you have them for uh, what I paid for them, which he did. And I thought, well, that was really great. So I went and sat in the front row and learned very quickly why front row in Ashland really isn't a good place to be because the projecting is, they're spitting all over the first three or four rows. It was just absolutely disgusting. So I think he'd been there the previous night and said, I'm not going to do this again. So you guys know this up here too. So, or you would if I didn't have these batteries. All right. So the other interesting comp uh, feature of the, of the small subunit is it's where the allosteric um, information is communicated. So the regulation happens because of binding of allosteric regulators to the small subunit. So the small subunit is pretty critical in that, even though it doesn't uh, catalyze the enzymatic reaction. Okay? There's a structure, and inside there we can see that there's iron that is uh, uh, attached to side chains of amino acids not too far away from a tyrosine. And I mentioned that this tyrosine gets a proton pulled away from it, creating an unpaired electron and an un unstable state. The reaction mechanism is there. I'm not going to go through it with you, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for it. So you can just look at it and admire it. But you can see in this active site that what's happening here is the nucleoside diphosphate that's being uh, held in place. You see that sulfhydryls are playing roles. You see a carboxyl playing a role. And the upshot of this is that a, this uh, unstable intermediate that uh, was created in the, um, in the uh, tyrosine in the small subunit is communicated up to here. You see here is this unpaired electron that is in place because of that instability that was created in the small subunit. This uh, starts a series of uh, reactions and process that ultimately result in the production of a uh, hydrogen at this point where we had an OH to start with. So we've created a deoxyribose, and as a consequence, we've created a ribo uh, I'm sorry, a deoxyribonucleoside diphosphate. The other thing that you notice here is we started with SHs, and we ended up with a disulfide bond. Now you know that whenever we do an enzymatic reaction, we have to return the enzyme to its active, I mean, to, to its original state, which means that this disulfide bond has got to be reduced. And it gets reduced in an interesting uh, reaction that ultimately involves NADPH. Okay? So that's not shown on here because it's not part of the reaction mechanism as such. But that has to be reduced to get the enzyme back to its active state. OK. Um, this shows what happens with that NADPH. And again, I'm not holding you responsible for this. But you can see that there's a lot of transfer of electrons that ultimately have to happen in order for this overall process uh, to occur. Here's that last step where we're taking that disulfide bond and we are uh, ultimately bringing it back up here to the uh, sulfhydryl state. Okay. We see that this molecule known as thyrodoxin plays a role in this process and that is something I think that you should know. Thyrodoxin is a very interesting uh, small peptide that plays very important roles in redox reactions inside of cells. Redox, reduction, oxidation, reactions inside of cells. Thyrodoxin uh, is a source of electrons to reduce this, and thyrodoxin gets its electrons from thyrodoxin reductase, which gets its electrons from NADPH. So we can see that this process happens ultimately to get those electrons to the enzyme and regenerate the enzyme to the, to the original state, and then that original state is used to convert ribose into deoxyribose within a nucleoside diphosphate. That big mouthful of, of words there. All right, well, let's get back to things that you really are uh, responsible for here. And this includes the synthesis of thymidine. Now, as I said, thymidine has an interesting pathway to becoming thymidine. It's made from DUD, I'm sorry, it's made from UDP. So you saw on that scheme that I gave you that ribonucleotide reductase converted UDP into DUDP, OK? Well, it might seem like the logical thing for the cell to do would be to simply take DUDP and convert it into DTDP, right? 
Well, it turns out cells don't do that. And at first, it's going to seem very odd why they don't do that. Instead of simply converting DUDP to DTDP, cells convert DUDP into DUMP. It takes a phosphate off and it takes a dump. Ha ha. It makes a dump. Right? Well, why does it do that? Why does it do that? It turns out that there's a very important reason why it does it. If you recall, our friend nucleo, uh, NDPK does what? It converts diphosphates into triphosphates. If we have much DUDP sitting around, what happens is NDPK will convert it into DUTP. And DUTP can be put into DNA by DNA polymerase. That's not a good long-term thing for cells to do. It happens at a very low frequency, actually. But to reduce the likelihood that cells will have that reaction going on, they have this enzyme that converts DUDP. Okay? And I'm saying this, you know, I'm saying this backwards, actually. As I'm saying it, I'm realizing I'm, I'm telling you an, an incorrect story. Oh, no. Ahern. All right. So I said it takes it from DUDP down to DUMP. It doesn't. It goes DUDP up to DUTP, and then it cleaves that. Now, the consequence of that is that cells will get a little bit of U in their DNA. A little bit of U's in their DNA. The enzyme that converts DUTP into DUMP is known as DUTPase. It's a very important enzyme in cells. Because if DUTPase, DUTPase is not active, then you're going to get much more U inside of your DNAs. I'll just back up and say it again, since I've already confused you once. All right, so let's just wipe the slate clean and we'll just start over. How's that? Okay? All right, we've got DUDP, right? The cells make DUDP. You have an NDPK that will take DUDP and make DUTP out of it. That's given because NDPK will work on all diphosphates and make them into triphosphates. It grabs DUDP, it makes DUTP. If DUTP hangs around for any period of time, DNA polymerase will use it in place of T because it looks just like a T as far as the DNA polymerase is concerned. All right? Remember that U pairs with A in RNA, so too will U pair with A in DNA if it's allowed to. Cells don't want that to happen, so they have an enzyme called DUTPase that they cleave DUTP into DUMP. They clip two phosphates off. DUTPase does that. If DUTPase is absent or not very active, cells will therefore get much more U into their DNA in place of T. Yes, sir? What type of negative effects will come with that? Chemically, U is not stable over as long of a period of time as, as T is. U can deaminate readily and make C. Problems. That's why we don't have U uh, to any extent, significant extent in our DNA. Yes, sir? The DUTPase, does it clip off a of pyrophosphate or two individual phosphates? The DUTPase clips off a of pyrophosphate. It clips off two phosphates with one, one fell swoop, one cut. All right, well, why am I showing you this on the screen? What's that got to do with this? Well, I had to tell you that because your book didn't, doesn't have a figure for that to tell you how we get DUMP. So DUMP has to be converted into DTMP. That's the next step. And yes, I will review this, this whole process as I get through it. All right, DUMP gains a methyl group from this monstrosity here. And we're going to call this THF, tetrahydrofolate. 
There are several tetrahydrofolates. I don't think we need to distinguish them. We're going to call this THF, tetrahydrofolate. Tetrahydrofolate is a source of the methyl group. The methyl comes and gets put right here on the U, and that makes it into a T. And again, this should be a DTMP. Bingo. Now, that's cool. The product of that reaction is a DTMP and something called dihydrofolate, which we're going to call DHF. So this is THF. THF gets converted into DHF in that process. No, I don't care if you, have, if you understand the mechanism. It doesn't matter for our purposes. You do need to know that in this reaction, DTMP, DUMP is being converted into DTMP. THF is being converted into DHF. Yes, Jenna? I was just going to tell you the enzyme. So the name of the enzyme that catalyzes all this is called thymidylate synthase. Thymidylate synthase. OK. Well, if we have DTMP, how do we convert it into DTDP? We have a monophosphate kinase that does that, right? We have a monophosphate kinase that converts it into DTDP. And how do we convert DTDP into DTTP? <laughs> I said it right. <laughs> What's the enzyme that converts diphosphates into triphosphates? NDPK. There we go. All right. So finally, we've got all four deoxyribonucleotides. Now, I said I would summarize, and I will. How do we get from UDP to DTTP? Let's step through the steps. UDP goes to DUDP by what enzyme? Ribonucleotide reductase. If you want to call that RNR, you can. RNR. RNR. UDP goes to DUDP catalyzed by RNR, ribonucleotide reductase. Okay. We've got DUDP, NDPK takes it up to DUTP. DUTPAs takes DUTP down to DUMP. DUMP goes to DTMP by thymidylate synthase. And bang, we're set. Now, I showed you in the reactions on um, uh, in the reactions on Friday that pure nucleotide synthesis requires folates. Okay, folates I said were the sources, one carbon sources. We see here that production of thymidine also requires folates. Folates are therefore very, very important for nucleotide metabolism. Just like NAD and NADH, cells only have a limited amount of them. When they use up what they have, they have to recycle it. This folate, DHF, has to be converted back to THF if cells are to keep nucleotide metabolism going. Because we have to have it for purines, we have to have it for pyrimidine, or this pyrimidine anyway. Thymidylate. OK. That turns out to be a very important consideration for cells in a couple of respects. Here's the enzyme that does that conversion. It's known as dihydrofolate reductase, DHFR. Don't confuse DHFR with DHF. DHFR is an enzyme. DHF is a molecule. This enzyme uses electrons from NADPH to do this conversion, at least partly. Okay. This reaction is essential. If this reaction does not happen, then cells are not recycling their DHF, and everything is going to accumulate as DHF, and cells are not going to be able to do nucleotide 
biosynthesis. This enzyme is a target for anti-cancer drugs and for um, antibiotics. Yes? This, I'm sorry, this is going from DHF to THF. Did I say it backwards again? Okay, hopefully I didn't. Yes, sir. The enzyme one more time, please, sir. The enzyme is dihydrofolate reductase, DHFR. Now, this enzyme is really important, as I said, because without this enzyme, you don't have enough folates that, uh, that you uh, need for nucleotide biosynthesis. Here's the enzyme, dihydrofolate going to tetrahydrofolate. There's some other reactions that have to happen to get it over to here. But without this step, we can't get this. All right? So this enzyme is targeted by some drugs that are used in chemotherapy to treat cancers. <coughs> Aminoptrin and methotrexate, of which methotrexate is probably the more commonly used one, are folate mimics. They're competitive inhibitors of the enzyme. They're competitive inhibitors of the enzyme. So the strategy of using, for example, methotrexate in chemotherapy is to, first of all, have some cells that are dividing more rapidly than normal cells. Some cancers are very aggressive in this respect. If you treat a person with methotrexate, what's going to happen to their nucleotide synthesis? Well. It's going to stop in regular cells just like it's going to stop in cancer cells. The strategy is to give it for a short period of time. And you flush it out of the body, basically, with the hope that in that short period of time that you've given it, the more aggressively growing cells, like cancer cells, are much more likely to be killed by it because they will not have nucleotides to divide. Now, there are some pretty good side effects with this as you can imagine because not all there are other cells in the body besides cancer cells that are dividing very rapidly they include cells in your intestines one of the reasons people get sick with some types of chemotherapy is it's interfering with the division of those cells in your intestines that are turning over very rapidly your digestive system goes on strike against you you lose appetite you have a variety of things you may lose your hair okay Rapidly dividing cells are targeted by this stuff. There's also another uh, target. Uh, fluorouracil is a, also a, it's actually a suicide inhibitor of thymidylate synthase. If you stop this reaction, cells have the same problem as if you stop this reaction. This is simply a competitive inhibitor. This is a suicide inhibitor. It kills the enzyme. Okay, um, this is what aminoptrin looks like. No, you won't need to know the structure. And a last consideration here is that there's another folate mimic that's actually used to kill bacteria. And it's on the screen here. It's called trimethoprim. And trimethoprim uh, inhibits the folate production. And it's particularly uh, important in bacteria because in bacteria, they have to synthesize their own folates. And this will stop, actually, the synthesis of folates. It doesn't happen in our cells because we get folates external to us but in our diet and so forth. And so you can kill, you can selectively kill bacteria with trimethoprim because they're making their own and they have to make their own, whereas we don't have to make our own and um, we're uh, protected by that. Trimethoprim is used um, frequently uh, for people who have um, bladder infections, particularly if they have uh, issues with being penicillin um, sensitive. It's very effective against bacteria. OK. Well, um, that takes care of what I want to say about deoxyribonucleotide synthesis in general. Now I'd like to turn our attention to regulation and remind you of some of the things that I've already talked about and then say some new things about ribonucleotide reductase. I probably don't need to say anything more about ATCase again. We went through this in some detail last year, and I mentioned it briefly to start uh, nucleotide biosynthesis. But I will say ATCase catalyzes that first step 
in the synthesis of pyrimidines. The end product of that synthesis, CTP, is a feedback inhibitor of it. ATP is an activator of it. Okay? This enzyme provides balance between purines and pyrimidines. Purines will favor its activation, thereby increasing the amount of pyrimidines. Pyrimidines will disfavor its activation and thereby reduce the amount of pyrimidines. The other enzyme I mentioned the other day was this enzyme known as PRPP amidotransferase. PRPP amidotransferase. It catalyzes the reaction that, uh, in fact, this is, I think, not accurate indicating that it inhibits here. The primary inhi inhibition is right here, the making of the phosphoribosylamine. I'll take, again, if the book has that, I'll take either answer, but basically the reaction right here is the critical one. And this is where PRPP amidotransferase works, all right? PRPP amidotransferase is inhibited by the end products of purine biosynthesis. These include AMP, GMP, and the branch point molecule, IMP, as well. Okay? So it's a feedback inhibition that's turning off this enzyme. And this was the enzyme that had the very interesting property that AMP and GMP together will completely inhibit the enzyme. AMP alone will not completely inhibit the enzyme. The enzyme will be a little bit active. GMP alone will allow the enzyme to be a little bit active. Why is that important? Well, it turns out to be very important. Imagine my balance of AMP and GMP is such that everything I have is in the form of GMP. If only GMP turns off this enzyme, I have no way to make AMP. So if only GMP is present, the enzyme is a little bit active. It continues making some of the stuff through here. And when it gets to the branch point, remember that this one is inhibited by GMP, then synthesis goes up here. If I only have AMP, the enzyme is a little bit active. It gets up here to the branch point and is inhibited there, and the cell makes GMP. So indirectly, PRPP amidotransferase is helping to balance A versus G. A versus G. Okay. Now, I'm sorry? Oh, the little ball is bouncing? Okay. Goodbye, ball. All right. Now, the last enzyme that I want to talk about, actually, before I do that, let me mention one other enzyme I mentioned as a regulatory capacity. It's not shown on here. And that was CTP synthase. CTP synthase was inhibited by CTP. CTP synthase converts UTP to CTP and therefore helps to balance U versus C. Yes, CTP synthase is another regulatory enzyme. It catalyzes the conversion of UTP into CTP, and it's inhibited by CTP. So therefore, UTP, I'm sorry, CTP synthase helps to balance U versus C. So we've got balance for pyrimidine versus purine. We've got balance for U versus C. We've got balance for A versus G. And what I'm getting ready to show you now is we have balance for the individual deoxyribonucleotides as well. Okay? That happens through ribonucleotide reductase. Okay? Ribonucleotide reductase has an allosteric site, it has two allosteric sites, and it has an active site. And this can get confusing, so I'm going to be very careful here. All right? Very careful. Here's the active site. The active site, you recall, is the place where the reaction is catalyzed. There are two allosteric sites to consider. Two allosteric sites to consider. One is called the specificity site, and one is called the activity site. Notice activity site sounds a lot like active site. They're not the same thing. Active site 
is where the reaction is catalyzed. Activity site is where the enzyme is controlled. All right, let's start with the activity site because it, t it tells us something very important about the enzyme. What does the activity site do? It determines if the enzyme is turned on or turned off. It's very simple. What binds to it? Well, if ATP binds to the activity site, the enzyme is turned on. That's pretty good because ATP indicates high energy. High energy, we want to be making nucleotides. Bang, that's good. The second molecule that can bind to the activity site is DATP. That is DATP. DATP will turn the enzyme off. And DATP is an indication of how many deoxyribonucleotides a cell has. Too many deoxyribonucleotides, enzyme off. Abundance of energy, enzyme on. Okay, so we have an enzyme on or off. That's pretty cool. It's the next site that I'm going to simplify for you. The next site I'm going to simplify for you. The next site is the specificity site. And it's rather complicated how it determines which things will be catalyzed. The specificity is controlling which substrates bind to the active site. All right. Now, let's imagine the following. Let's imagine I have an abundance of purines in my body. I'm short on pyrimidines, deoxypyrimidines. All right. How might I control this enzyme? Well, if I had an abundance of purines, I know I need to make more pyrimidines. So if I had some way of measuring purines, I could turn the enzyme on for pyrimidines only. And that's what the specificity site does. Now, the specificity site will bind to triphosphates. The active site will bind to diphosphates. How does this work? Let's say I've got a ton of, of uh, DGTP in my cell. If I have a ton of DGTP, I sure as the heck don't want to be converting GDP into more DGDP because I've already got too much. A ton of DGTP will bind here, and it will disfavor binding of purines at the active site. Thus, GDP and ADP will be disfavored if a purine binds here. If a pyrimidine binds here, let's say I've got a ton of DCTP, then Pyrimidines will be disfavored here, and purines will be favored. So if I have DCTP bound here, then this guy is going to prefer to bind to GDP or ADP. Now, I know there's a lot of things here. There's triphosphates, there's diphosphates, there's ribonucleotides, there's deoxyribonucleotides, and all the words I'm going to throw at you with this are just going to be mush after a while. I want you to sit down, look at the highlights I'm going to give you for this, and understand what is binding at each of these sites and how the enzyme is affected. Now, I will stop at this point and take questions because I'm sure I probably raised a few. Yes, uh, Emily. This is R1. I said R2 earlier, and I, that was incorrect. It, it's in the R1. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. That was, you're drinking. I thought that was your hand up there. Oh, yes, uh, Connie. Um, I have a question. Actually, got the anti Yes, the anti cancer drug, competitive one. How does adding the inhibitor for, uh, uh, let's say, methotrexate, how does adding methotrexate and then flushing it out kill the cancer cell? 
Well, during the period of time that the methotrexate is there in abundance, DNA, uh, I'm sorry, uh, nucleotide synthesis is going to be stopped. So if cells are needing to divide and they run out of nucleotides, they die. So the idea is that cancer cells are dividing more rapidly than regular cells. So they're more susceptible during that period of time when I've got them, uh, when I have the drug present. I flush it out so that I don't end up killing the organism, uh, the, the person taking the, the um, anti-cancer drug. Uh, but preferentially, I hopefully kill more cancer cells than I kill anti-cancer, or, or non-cancer cells, not anti-cancer cells. Okay? Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay. I will summarize these in the highlights. Please uh, look at that. If you have questions, let me know. Well, in the last 10 minutes, uh, what I want to do is talk about uh, some of the byproducts of nucleotide metabolism and their impact on human health. Okay? Their impact on human health. The first of these that I'll talk about is a very interesting disease known as severe combined immune deficiency. This is a disease where it's a genetic disease where a person, uh, there's a couple of causes, but one relative to nucleotide metabolism is lack of the enzyme adenosine deaminase. Okay? Now, first of all, let me tell you what the disease is. So it, it, it's a complete failure of the immune system. If you've heard of the bubble boy story of, a, of, of quite a few years ago, this was a kid who was born without an immune system. They recognized it very quickly, and they put him in a sterile bubble where he lived most of his life before he finally died. He lived most of his life in this sterile bubble because even the simplest bacterium that, is, that you and I would have you know, ourselves coated with would kill him. Okay? Immune system completely lacking. The question is, how and why is his immune system lacking? All right? Well, what you see here is part of the breakdown of purine nucleotides. Here's AMP. Let's say I'm a cell, I have, brought, I have ingested a nucleic acid, or I've even ingested a bunch of AMP, and I want to break it down to its substituents so that I can use them as necessary. Individuals that are lacking this enzyme right here, adenosine deaminase, are susceptible to developing SCID, severe combined immune deficiency. Okay? Why? Well, it turns out that if this enzyme is deficient, we back up a whole bunch of processes, and what accumulates is DATP. Now, based on what I just told you, you should be able to tell me what the consequences of DATP accumulating would be. What's going to happen to cells when they've got a lot of DATP? They're going to shut down the reductase. They're not going to divide very well. And this problem appears to manifest itself mostly in the immune system. That is the accumulation of DATP. Other cells aren't as affected by that. But in the immune system, they're very affected by it, and they have no nucleotides to make DNA. To mount an immune response, our immune cells have to divide considerably. They can't. Okay. So adenosine deaminase, very important enzyme in that respect. Another enzyme that's important was one we saw up here in, in salvage that I haven't talked about, but I'll just show you here. The, this is an enzyme that's important in recycling some of the purines to be able to use them. So for example, let's say I have a bunch of guanine, that's a base, laying around, and I need to make nucleotides, so I take that base that's laying around known as guanine, I combine it with uh, PRPP, and when I do that, I create GMP. All right, so now I'm on my way to making nucleotides. And I've salvaged a base that was sitting around. You'll see that this enzyme is called HGPRT. It also works on hypoxanthine. So what's hypoxanthine? Well, hypoxanthine is produced right around here. So it's like a purine. It's basically a purine as well. So this enzyme is helping to scavenge through salvage, purine bases and make purine nucleotides. Well, why is this important? Individuals that are deficient in this enzyme develop a bizarre uh, syndrome. Okay? 
The bizarre syndrome is known as Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. And I think I've got it right here. Yeah, Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Okay, that's it right there. And this syndrome has many problems, but particularly in young males, what happens is that they will literally chew their lips off. Yeah, yeah. It's a bizarre neuro, uh, neurological um, problem, and they have to be restrained because they will literally, when they have a chance, do that. Okay? Now, this is a relatively minor enzyme, it would appear, um, and the full link of the neurological phenomenon to the deficiency of the enzyme is not completely understood, but suffice it to say, sometimes even what appear to be very minor enzymes can have major uh, effects. Needless to say, retardation and a variety of things happen as a result of the deficiency of this enzyme. So salvage is important. If salvage doesn't work properly, we can see real problems. The last thing I want to say relative to nucleotide metabolism is something also that's interesting from a perspective of human health. And to show you that, I need to go back to my purine breakdown pathway. Okay? So here's the one I showed you earlier. Purines are being broken down, AMP to adenosine, blah, 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 blah. What I'm getting ready to tell you isn't a deficiency of an enzyme. It's a su sufficiency of something else, meaning we have too much. Okay? If we have too many purines, and by the way, the, the, the uh, disease that arises from this is called gout. Gout is a disease where... Uh, the first place people usually realize is they have this excruciating pain in their big toe. It used to be used a lot for comic effect in the movies. Oh my God, my toe, et cetera, et cetera. It used to be known as rich man's disease because diets that were rich in red meat, red wine, and so forth were rich in purines, and only the rich ever got this disease. They got it because they had too many purines, and when they had too many purines, this breakdown pathway takes over and starts making a lot of uric acid. Well, uric acid is a, is a good and normal thing. Okay, It's on the breakdown pathway to um, excretion. Uric acid is actually an excretion product for um, birds, for example. It's a way of getting rid of excess nitrogen. We don't get rid of nitrogen that way. We actually get rid of it with urea. But this is a normal breakdown pathway. The problem is that uric acid doesn't ionize very much. It's not a very strong acid. And as a consequence, what will happen is if too much is produced, it will crystallize. And the place where it will crystallize is the gravitationally lowest place in your body, which ends up being in your big toe. And when it crystallizes, it crystallizes in nerve cells, and that's why the excruciating pain arises. Now, there's a downside to gout, but there's also a good side to gout that was realized a few years ago. And it, too, is not fully understood why, but it's an interesting observation. The observation is that people who tend to have gout tend to be less likely to have multiple sclerosis. Uric acid may have some sort of a protective effect against multiple sclerosis. The relationship is not understood at this time, but it's an interesting observation that something that can cause a lot of pain might actually have a little bit of benefit. Well, if you have the pain, probably you're not thinking too much of the benefit at the time because, as I said, this can be excruciating uh, for some people. And the way they treat it is they treat uh, with uh, a, a, a compound called allopurinol. And allopurinol inhibits this enzyme, which you notice catalyzes two separate reactions here and stops the production of uric acid. Allopurinol is a very effective treatment uh, for gout. It really can stop the pain because it stops the production of uric acid. Yes, sir? This is only from an excess of purines. That's correct. So diet modification would be sufficient? Diet his question is, good, is a good one. Is diet modification used? And the answer is yes, it is to some extent. Uh, in modern times, they've gone much more to using allopurinol as a treatment for it, but diet modification is another approach to doing that. Okay? All right, folks, let's, I will see you on Wednesday.